A couple months ago, there was a certain member of our household who was obsessed with bathroom talk. Now, I won't give away any names here, but this particular person happens to be the shortest person in our family. And she took every opportunity to insert the words poop and pass gasser into every conversation. And yes, that's right, pass gasser became a proper noun and a title bestowed on anyone and everyone. And she thought that all of this was so hilarious. Now, as parents, we took a couple of different approaches. There were times where we just ignored it and carried on with life. And then there were other times when we would confront it and remind her that, you know, we're at the kitchen table right now and that's bathroom talk and bathroom talk doesn't belong at the kitchen table. And then of course there were times where the context in which she would place these words was so hilarious and the mischievous twinkle in her eye, we would just burst out laughing. Well, I am very pleased to report that in our household, we don't have a lot of bathroom talk anymore. We have moved on. Except as I was preparing for this week's sermon, I realized I was being thrown right back into bathroom talk, right in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 to 14. Now you may be wondering, what am I talking about? You didn't hear Ray use any bathroom talk as he read scripture. Let me provide you just a little bit of the backstory. In his letter to the church in Philippi, there came a point where Paul is telling this beloved church to be on their guard for certain Jewish teachers who were telling non-Jewish church members that in order to be right with God, in order to be part of God's family, they needed to be circumcised and adhere to other Jewish laws. And according to these teachers, the law was first and foremost. And Paul is saying, no, that's not the way it is. Serving and worshiping King Jesus, the Messiah, is first and foremost. And let me tell you, I am very qualified to speak into matters of Judaism. And Paul says, let me tell you why I'm so qualified. And he goes on to list all of the reasons that he has credibility to speak about the Jewish law. He's an expert and an insider. He knows what he's talking about and he has all the necessary credentials. He talks about the status and advantages he has as a result of his family and his ancestry. He's an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin. He's been the highest achiever. He's belonged to the strictest sect, the Pharisees. He has status, he has privilege, both due to his family heritage and to his own actions and achievements. His resume is very, very good. And he's, it's like he's saying, listen up. I'm the top expert here. And you know all of those achievements and statuses I just listed? That amazing resume I just produced? Well, it's all rubbish compared to knowing Christ. And so here enters our bathroom talk. Because by rubbish, Paul means sewage, excrement, or dog dung. It's all poop, Paul says. As I edge closer to my 40s, there's something that I have noticed about myself and also many other women who are nearing their 40s and into their 40s and into their 50s. And that is a strong desire to finally be comfortable in our own skin. A desire to show up as our full selves and not shrink from who we are. A need to find our own voice and to speak our own truth, a desire to claim that we are enough and God's gifts for us are enough. 
And we want to be able to list our statuses, our achievements, our backgrounds, our family history, all of the things that make up who we are and be able to confidently say, this is me. So how does all of that square up with our passage today? Is my desire to show up as my full self and be comfortable in my own skin? Dog dung? Is it all poop? A naive reading of this text would answer yes to that question. It could say, it doesn't matter who you are or where you're from or what you've done. All that matters is Jesus and knowing him. Or even more damaging, you need to erase who you are and push down who you are in order to know and follow Christ. And you know what I call this type of reading of this text and other ideology, similar ideologies that emerge from it? Dog dung. It doesn't take very long to look at this toxic ideology of the need to erase or repress oneself and see parallels with the treatment of Indigenous children in Canada through church-run residential schools a place where children were banned from speaking their own languages and expressing and ex practicing any aspects of their cultures. So how can we know Christ and center our lives around knowing Christ without erasing who we are? A first step is to allow Christ to inform and transform and reform our identities and our statuses and our credibilities, but not to erase them. And we see this example in Paul. Paul's encounter with Christ dramatically changed his life. And yes, some of the credentials we heard about in verses five and six shifted. Paul no longer carried the title Pharisee. He turned from being a persecutor of Jesus followers to a Jesus follower himself. But in becoming a Jesus follower, many of his other credits and statuses weren't erased. He was still Jewish. He had not given up his heritage. Rather, Christ informed and transformed and reformed him. And Paul lived in such a way that his credits and his status did not act as a substitute for knowing Christ. So how can we know Christ and center our lives around Christ without erasing who we are? If we want to get practical here, here are some things that we could do. Now, what I'm about to suggest isn't exactly quick. So you might want to think of it as a summer project. We could take a piece of paper and draw a line right down the middle and label the left side, my credits, and label the right side, Jesus. And in the left side, we would list all of our credits, the things we've inherited, the things we didn't earn, and the things that we achieved. We list all the things that identify us and make us who we are. And then we can ask ourselves these questions. Do I use some of these credits as a substitute for knowing Jesus? Have I somehow believed that this credit of mine could replace deep connection with Christ? Are there things on my list of credits that need to go? Are there certain credits that I have that get in the way of others knowing Christ? What on my list of credits most needs to be transformed by Christ? Not erased, but transformed. A tangible example for, of this for me would be my white skin. I do not need to be ashamed of the color of my skin. I don't need to wish that I had a different color of skin, but I do need to recognize the unearned privileges that my white skin has afforded me. And with the help of Christ, work towards repairing the damage that this has caused. 
And finally, the last question, are there credits that I have tried to erase and try to suppress because others have said, you can't hold that credit and know Jesus. So that's the left column, the credit column. Now for the column on the right, the Jesus column. And this one could take a bit longer. So pick one gospel to read, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. If you want the shortest one, go with Mark. If you want the longest, most complicated, or the most complicated one, go with John. And read one of the Gospels with an eye on getting to know Jesus better by answering these questions. What matters to Jesus? What doesn't matter to Jesus? What got Jesus into trouble? Who did Christ show mercy towards? Who did Christ save his harshest words for? What broke his heart? What made him angry? Who did he exclude? Who did he include? And once we have completed each column and compared the two, we can ask ourselves how the Gospels and knowing Jesus informs and transforms and reforms our list of credits. When Paul talks about knowing Christ, it's not a head knowledge type of thing. It's personal, like a parent who knows their child so well that when they see that mischievous twinkle in their eye, they know a bathroom joke's about to come. Biblical scholar and professor N.T. Wright says this, if you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what it means to be human, look at Jesus. If you want to know what love is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what grief is, look at Jesus. And go on looking until you're not just a spectator, but you're actually part of the drama, which has him as a central character. As we look to Jesus, as we strive to know Jesus and to make him central, as we work towards having our identities transformed and informed and reformed by Christ, but not erased, we can take comfort in some of Paul's final words from this passage. I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I have it made, but I am well on my way reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me.